One of the best ways to learn something is by watching somebody else do it. If you want to know how to play basketball, you watch Damian Lillard. If you want to learn how to play tennis, you look at Serena Williams. If you want to learn how to flip houses, you go to Chip and Joanna Gaines. If you want to learn how to be happy, to whom do you look? Turn to somebody sitting next to you and just share, who in, your, who in your life do you see as being happy? You say, I would like to be happy like them. Look around. Some of you are spread out. Um, some of you maybe have to slide down a road uh, to, to uh, grab somebody else. All right, this is the sixth in a series of messages called Fix Your Upper. Uh, for five seasons, Chip and Joanna Gaines uh, filmed 179 episodes of Fix Your Upper, in which they fixed up houses. Uh, we're talking about how we can do a fixer-upper in the way we think so that we can begin to think Christianly, think like God wants us to think, and in the process of thinking right, discover true happiness. In the New Testament book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul shows us how to find true happiness. He tells us that much of happiness has to do with the way we think. The book is organized around five wrong ways of thinking and five right ways of thinking. Whether you're a teenager or parent, single or married, divorced or widowed, you can get into wrong ways of thinking. And you need to reorient your mind. So far, the Apostle Paul has told us one thief that robs us of happiness, circumstances. Uh, we tend to think circumstances determine our happiness. You know, if we have a health problem, maybe we've had a fight with our mate or a family member or a close friend. Um, maybe uh, we're having financial struggles. We think, well, of course, I, I should be unhappy. But the Apostle Paul has been beaten unfairly and thrown in prison, yet he exudes joy. So circumstances don't need to dictate our happiness. Turn to our text today. It's Philippians chapter 2. If you want to use our Bibles, it's on page 1,179. Apostle Paul identifies a second thief that robs us of happiness, people. Another wrong way to think is that people make us unhappy or happy. We think if I only didn't have such a stupid teacher... If I only didn't have such a ridiculous coach, if I didn't have such a demanding boss, then I'd be happy. Apostle Paul says, no, that's the wrong way to think. It's true that people do things and say things that cause us to get upset, but the truth is we decide whether we're going to be happy. The Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus Christ is the extreme example of how to think right in order to experience real happiness. Jesus said, I told you this so that my joy may be in you. Jesus wants you to experience happiness. So Paul says, if you want to know about happiness, look at Jesus Christ. He starts in Romans or Philippians 2, verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, he uses this word mind 16 times in Philippians. He says we need to learn to think like Jesus. Peter says... Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, mindset, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. This is why spending time in our journals or in the Bible is so important. We begin to take on the mind of Christ, begin to think like he does. Paul's point is that if you want to know true happiness, think the way Christ does. Maybe you're not sure what you believe about Jesus. Maybe you used to believe, but you've drifted away. 
The verses we're going to look at today tell us very clearly who Jesus is and how he thinks. Paul shows us two ways Jesus sets an example for thinking right. One, think of others as if they were more important than yourself. Uh, Chris Quinn talked about this last week. He said, you know, you, you think of people as if they are more important than yourselves. You don't just treat them that way. Apostle Paul writes, in humility, value others above yourselves. Paul tells us that if you want to be happy, if we want to be happy, we must learn to think of other people and treat other people as if they are more important than ourselves. They're not more important than us, but we're to treat them as if they are. This does not mean you have a low view of yourself. To the contrary, only if you have a view that you are infinitely valuable can you afford to treat other people as if they're more important. During the American Civil War, General George B. McClellan was in charge of the great army of the Potomac. People loved him. And he loved hearing them say that he was a young Napoleon. Yet his efforts were less than sensational. Uh, President Lincoln named him General in Chief in hopes that that would get some action. But still he procrastinated. So one night, uh, President Lincoln and two of his cabinet members went to visit McClellan. Upon arriving, they learned that he was gone at a wedding. So they sat and waited. An hour later, he came home and he walked past them without even recognizing, without even saying hi to the president and went up to his room. About a half hour later, Lincoln sent word by the servant. He says, tell McClellan the gentlemen are waiting. Servant came back and says, General McClellan has gone to bed. His associates, angry, Lincoln just got up and led the way home. He says, this is no time for discussions of uh, etiquette and, uh, you know, personal uh, politeness. I would hold McClellan's horse if it would bring us success. It was this attitude of humility that made Lincoln a great man and a successful president. He viewed McClellan as if he were more important than himself. Jesus is the best example Paul can think of of thinking of others as more important than ourselves. Jesus left all his trappings in heaven where all the angels would bow to him every day. He was the son of God, the creator of the universe. He came to unselfishly serve us. If we are to think like Jesus, we can't selfishly think of ourselves and put ourselves first, but we put our other people's interests ahead of our own. A San Diego psychologist has uh, produced a little survey, he says, that will show this principle over and over again. You could try it right now or try it this afternoon. List the 10 people you know the best in your life. Then after their name, put an H for happy or a U for unhappy. Or put, no, no, let's be H for happy and an N for not happy. Then list uh, by their names an S for selfish or U for unselfish. He says almost invariably, you'll find out the people who are happy are unselfish. People who are unhappy are selfish. Jesus is the supreme example of being totally unselfish. The second way Jesus thinks right is be a servant. Now, if ever familiarity breeds contempt, this is it. You say, I've heard to be a servant. Of course. I get this. Please stay with me. I want you to hear this in a new way. There's no question in Paul's mind that Jesus is the supreme example of being a servant. Philippians 2.5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset 
as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now just as a tangent, don't miss Paul's strong case for the divinity of Christ. When he says Jesus being in very nature God, the word he uses for nature is morphe. We get the word metamorphosis. Morphe means the essential form of something that never alters. In other words, Jesus is God. He will always be God and that never is altered. Now look at the next line. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Here, nature, same English word, is the Greek word schema. The Apostle Paul has a massive vocabulary. We, we consider him one of the ten best minds in history. Here he uses the word schema, which refers to an outward and changeable form. So in other words, Jesus is divine. That will never change. But for 33 years, he took on the outward form of a human. It was temporary. He's essentially divine. The Bible is adamant on this point that Jesus is fully divine. Jesus is fully God, the powerful universe, uh, creator of the universe, just like his father. It was because he was fully divine that he did not need to view his deity as something to be grasped, but he could choose to limit his powers for a while. Christ made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness. Some say, see, he may have been God in heaven, but when he came to earth, he made himself nothing. He wasn't God when he was here. No. Again, this is where understanding the Greek is important. Greek does not mean he made himself nothing. He gave up his divinity. It means he gave up the voluntary use of his divinity during his time on earth. That's why we see him over and over again praying so much to his father, getting uh, God's direction. Do I do this healing? You know, we prayed before he, he died. If it's possible, Lord, take this cup of going to the cross from me. Could we do it another way? He divested himself during his time on earth of the privileges of the independent use of his power as God in order to serve us. Jesus' greatest miracle on this earth was raising Lazarus. You probably know the story. The amazing thing about Lazarus is that when he raised him, Lazarus wasn't just dead. He was like dead, dead. He was like they already had the funeral dead. When Jesus came to raise Lazarus. Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. So listen what happens when Jesus raises him. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, that he raised Lazarus from the dead, believed in him. Uh, Bethany became a tourist attraction. People would come from all around to see Lazarus. Let's see that guy that was raised. Now the Jewish leaders are talking, verse 48, if we let him go on like this, Jesus, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So the Jewish leaders say, this, this is a problem. Verse 53, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. It was because Jesus raised Lazarus that they plotted to crucify Jesus. Sometime later, Jesus went back to Bethany, where Lazarus lived. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there in Bethany and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus. You see, Lazarus had become a big deal, a Lazarus sighting, whom he had raised from the dead. So here shows you how desperate they are. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. They said, not only do we have to get rid of Jesus, we've got to get rid of Lazarus. He's living proof of how powerful Jesus is. 
Now, Jesus went to Jerusalem with his disciples. This is when he's going to, they're going to lay down palm branches and hail him, Hosanna, the king of the Jews. And, and uh, there are throngs of people. And on the way, he takes his disciples aside. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. The disciples are thinking, what is he talking about? We have momentum. Everybody's following Jesus Ever since he raised Lazarus from the dead, everybody's coming to us. What in the world is he talking about? Then, James and John, then meaning, Mark is saying, right next, right after Jesus had said that, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Too bad about the spitting and the flogging and the killing, but we want you to do what we ask you. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. We want to be number two and number three in your kingdom. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, not indignant because James and John had been insensitive after Jesus says he's going to be spit on and whipped and killed and like, how can you be so, you know, callous? No, no, no. They're indignant because they want to be number two and number three. Why didn't we think of it first? Then Jesus called them together again. He's thinking, I think I picked the wrong guys. Then Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentile lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. The disciple says, yeah, we know. That's how it works. People at the top leverage people underneath them to get what they want. Jesus responds with four words. Not so with you. He says, I'm introducing a brand new way to live. The old way was me first. You want to become uh, a person who experiences fulfillment? You want to find true happiness, which is what we're talking about in this series? Here's a famous line. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For slave in that, uh, that one in Greek, it's, it's doulos. That's like the back of the back of the line of servants. He says, here's the new way. Be a servant. And then in one of Jesus' most famous lines on this earth, for even, why don't you read this with me? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's not intuitive. It's the opposite of what we think will bring us happiness. But just imagine what would happen in your marriage, in your family, on your team, at your school, in this nation, if just Christians began to live this way. 
Paul goes on, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice, giving his life for us. Jesus, Jesus served us by sacrificing himself for us. So what happens when we begin to think the way Jesus thinks? We treat others as if they're more important than ourselves. What happens when we sacrifice in order to serve people? God will lift you up and give you true happiness. Paul writes, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. This is one of Paul's most famous lines. And gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says you can bow to Christ in this life or you can bow to him in the next, but be assured Everyone will bow to Jesus someday. Because Jesus humbled himself and took the form of a slave and died on the cross, God exalted him to a place above all other beings on earth and in the universe. Just as God lifted Christ up, if you humbly serve others, he will lift you up. That's how God works. For 13 years, Joseph languished in prison as a faithful servant of God, and then God lifted him up to the number two position in Egypt. For 10 years, David served God humbly as a fugitive in the desert. Then God put him on the throne. You humbly serve others? out of obedience to the Lord, and God will take care of you and give you joy. When you give up your rights and put others' needs ahead of your own, the pleasant surprise is you discover joy. You probably saw this, an elderly woman went into a restaurant to eat in Alabama, and three guys came in after her, and they saw her, and they said, why don't we go sit with her? They made her night. Turns out it was the one-year anniversary of her husband's death. They took a photo, selfie, and posted it, and it, it went viral. Well, Ernie Johnson from inside the NBA saw this, and, you know, he's kind of always the guy looking for human interest stories and the funny stuff that goes into that uh, show. And uh, he invited them during the halftime game of uh, the Nuggets and the Blazers. That's why I think you probably saw this. Okay, so they didn't think about themselves. They thought about this woman. Made her night. A small gesture of kindness. And they ended up becoming famous, coming on inside the NBA. And it brought them joy. If you want to know true happiness, think the way Christ thinks. When we stop seeing people as our problems... And start serving them as if they are more important than ourselves. We find joy. Father, thank you for this great text from the Apostle Paul. Telling us to think the way your son Jesus does. And Lord Jesus, we want to do that. Our whole mindset is me first. We always go selfish we don't want to inconvenience ourselves for others. But if we could just reorient ourselves and think like you did, Lord Jesus, we'd actually find we're much happier people. We experience the fulfillment and joy that you want us to have. You want to tell Jesus that today? I know everybody here wants to be happy. The way to get there is just the opposite of the way we think. It's by serving others. Thinking of others is more important than ourselves and not being selfish. Tell God you want to do that. If you've never given your life to Christ, invite Christ to come into your life. You can never do this without his help, him living inside of you. You pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your example to us of serving us. And we want to serve other people in the same way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.